Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We welcome those of you gathered here and those of you who are joining us from home. This morning, uh, we continue our fall worship series, Portraits of Christ. Uh, and we consider Christ the servant today. Uh, we invite you, if you have a personal favorite portrait of Christ, to share it in the gathering space. And if you're here today uh, and worshiping here, please make sure you check out our, our rogues gallery in the gathering space before you, uh, before you leave. If you're worshiping from home, we invite you to join us in person at 815, 931, or 1045. We thank you for continuing to support our many ministry partners, our food partners in Burton and Bainbridge. Uh, Crop Walk will take place on the 10th of October. And if you'd like to support Crop, Crop Walk, there's more information about it in the announcements today. Uh, and you can designate any gifts, crop on your check, and those funds will go to support the, um, the cause. Hurricanes and flooding, we're partnering with uh, LDR and LWR in these efforts, and you can just designate if you have a particular um, disaster that you want to support, and we will get those, uh, those funds to, uh, to the folks in need. There's a sign up for the women's retreat, <coughs> excuse me, in the gathering space. Uh, communion, if you will be communing from home, please remember to have your elements prepared and place them on your home altar. In our prayers, we pray for all those in our ongoing prayer concerns. We pray in particular for those who are hospitalized and, uh, and for those on the front lines, the health healthcare workers and, uh, and physicians. We're grateful for your support in so many ways, and we invite you to join us online each morning at 1130 for a daily devotion. Let's, uh, let's prepare for worship now with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the blessing of this beautiful day. We thank you for the many ways that we see your handiwork uh, all around us. We pray that as we, uh, as we immerse ourselves into scripture today, we might, we might see how it is you would have us live our lives, how it is that you might have us serve one another. Be present, be present in our singing, be present in our praying. Guide us and direct us and keep us always in your will and in your way. Amen. What are we going to start with? Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. Let's stand and join Atrium as we sing Rock of Ages.
be seated, and if you brought your Bibles with you today, we're in Mark's Gospel. We're in the ninth chapter, beginning at the, uh, the 30th verse. Jesus is going to uh, talk about his, uh, his journey to Jerusalem and his death, and the disciples are going to prove that they don't get it. Then they went on ahead and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. They did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of our Lord according to Mark. Madeline, you are so talented. It seems like 
just last, I have to embarrass you just to, for a second. It seemed like just last week you were here in our preschool. She did a great job. And there's, uh, we welcome Joe Holiday back today. Joe had hip replacement surgery a few weeks ago. It's great to see you back at the soundboard. Please pray with me. Gracious God, this servant hood that you call us to is not always easy. Show us how it is you would have, our, have us reach out to serve others, to reach out to those uh, different from us, to reach out to those in need. In your name, we pray these in all things. Amen. In the Daytona 500 in 1979, in front of 100,000 fans, Richard Petty <clears throat> ended his 45-race losing streak and picked up the biggest prize in stock car racing at the time, about, about $75,000 back then. But his win came as a complete surprise, not because he wasn't amazing or capable. He had already won the race countless times. But this particular race, this race in 1979, going into the final lap, Petty was 30 seconds behind the two front runners going into the final lap. And on that final lap, car two went to pass car one, and car one drifted into the infield. The two cars then collided and came to a stop in the infield. Donnie Allison and Cale Yarborough, the drivers of the cars, got out of their cars and began to fight with one another as Richard Petty cruised to win the race. Jesus said, the last shall be first. I'm not sure he was talking about stock car racing. But he's clear in this gospel, isn't he? The, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. But let's be honest, that's not, not how most of us have lived our lives. That's not what we see going on in much of our country. It's probably not what most of us were taught growing up. Sure, we heard this verse in Sunday school, maybe from... Uh, the pulpit on Sunday morning, but then Monday came. And for most of us, Monday greatness is about being number one, being a winner, being successful, power, reputation, status, position. When was the last time we saw the losing Super Bowl team dancing around on the field, raising two fingers, shouting, we're number two? Or the last place team celebrating the short season? Can you imagine a political slogan about making America last? Being last of all and servant of all is not what we usually strive for. That's not the greatness to which we aspire. If being great means being last of all and servant of all, perhaps Jesus is getting at something that we need to pay attention to. It seems the disciples don't understand what greatness is about any more than we do. What were you arguing about along the way, he asks, but they were silent because they had been arguing about who was the greatest among them. Jesus didn't get an answer to his question, just silence. The silence of being found out, the silence of being discovered. He isn't asking for his sake. He knows what they were arguing about. Their argument happened on a public road out in the open, but his question comes later in the privacy of the house. Jesus is moving the conversation inward. He's, got, he's not gathering information for himself. He's inviting the disciples to, uh, to reflect on what it means to be great. He's presenting the disciples with a lesson about servanthood. What does a person have to do to be a servant leader? When did you ever say to anyone, your destiny in life is to be a wonderful servant? The world wires us socially to aspire doesn't it? What does it really mean to be great? What if greatness looks a little different to God than it does to the human family? Imagine that conversation on the road between the disciples. Peter uh, probably bragging, Jesus always looks to me first. I'm part of the inner circle. I'm the spokesperson for the group. I'm the greatest. And then his brother Andrew, who introduced him to Jesus, says, now wait a minute. I was the one who invited you to come to Jesus. I got you here. I'm the greatest. James and John chime in. Hey, you two, you both missed the point. Greatness means sacrifice. We gave up a lucrative 
fishing enterprise that our Father would have given to us. And so we're the greatest. Matthew then. If you want to talk about giving up, I was a tax auditor. None of you gave up as much as I did. I'm the greatest. Jesus' question again. What were you guys talking about back there? Silence. Not a word. You want to be great? You truly want to be great, he says. You must first be a servant. Now, he'll bring this up again in the, in the gospel, in Mark's gospel, as well as the others. He'll bring it up on, on Holy Thursday, won't he? when he takes a basin and a towel and he washes the disciples' feet. And in, in doing that, what Jesus does is he takes on the role of a servant. And he, just, he doesn't just take on the role of a servant. He takes on the role of the lowest servant. You see, it was the job of the lowest servant in the household to wash the feet of the guests when they would arrive. A person who has the heart of a servant cultivates a quality of humility in their leadership. How do you measure humility? And how do you find if someone has humility? Am I the best judge of my humility? St. Paul's School of Theology in Kansas City was looking for a new president. They came up with a great job description and posted it online. School of Theology, seeking president, must be a, a devoted follower of Jesus, a lover of God. And then they, then they decided they wanted their leader to measure up to Jesus. And they began to look at Jesus and his qualities. And they realized that they could listen to each person preach a sermon. They could look at their track record and the places where they had served. But they puzzled over one particular quality of Christ that they wanted their new president to have. How to measure his or her humility. Well over 100 candidates applied for the job. The search team narrowed the list to five. All were eminently qualified. But who carried the quality of Christ that they wanted their leader to have? Humility. And how did they measure that? And then they came up with a brilliant idea. A representative from the search committee will go to each of the five institutions where the finalists work, and we will interview the janitor in the building. We will get their view of the presidential candidate. And that's what they did. They put their plan in action. And it was a janitor who worked with William McElvain who gave such a glowing appraisal of Mac that he was selected as the next president of St. Paul's. The search committee, in a flash of genius, understood that those who truly follow Christ, who embody the humility of Christ, treat janitors and governors with equal dignity. Everyone is the same in Christ's eyes. Greatness comes to us when we share with others. When we share with others who have nothing to share with us. Recall the, the boy in Scripture who shared five loaves and two fish with 5,000? That's greatness. Earlier this summer, I sat at the feet of a group of teens from Georgia and from here who gave a week, a week of their summer break to offer assistance to homeowners in one of the poorest regions of the country. That's greatness. Those kids are de destined for greatness. Greatness comes when we forgive one who has neither asked for our forgiveness and struggles to change their behavior. Those who refuse to carry bitterness or envy toward another carry greatness. When we respond to the needs of others, when we refuse thoughts and actions of hatred, we're on our way to greatness. When we overcome fear, tear down walls and make room for one who is different or one who is in need, we're destined for greatness. Our preschool is back in session. I love our preschool. Last week I sat with one of our classes as they began their lunch. They pray before snack. They pray before meals. I asked them what we should, what we should pray for, and they, they gave me the usual answers. Food, drink, parents, teachers, pets. And then one little girl said, hey, Pastor Rob, let's pray that, let's pray that we're kind to each other. I tell you, that little girl is destined for greatness. Greatness is not something that we can achieve or earn. It, it arises within us when our lives are in balance and we, and we step into our better self. That's the life that Jesus offers. That's the life I want to live. This kind of greatness happens in simple, ordinary, and mundane ways. 
It often goes unnoticed, and yet it's there. Greatness is always a choice set before us. She's in her 40s now. She recently wrote a letter to her grade school phys ed teacher. She reminded him that on her first day of class, he announced that they would run a race of about 600 meters. She knew that she would come in last place. She knew she would come in last place because she always came in last place. She told the teacher she really didn't want to run. She really didn't want to race. She, she explained it was because she always came in last. And he asked her if she'd try anyway, just this once. And try she did. And she came in last. But she said, she said, this time it was different. She said, when the race started, all the way around the track for a lap and a half, running right next to me was my teacher. And he wasn't just running, he was cheering. Good effort, great running, magnificent work. You've got this. You can do this. She said, when I finished that race, even though I came in last place, I felt like I won an Olympic medal. She went on to say that after that moment, she began to try things that she never would have before. You see how this works? Jesus is like that teacher running alongside us, offering encouragement, love, and grace. It was the 1940s, and Roy was dirt poor. He was a Baptist preacher. He lived his life for the Lord. His older brother had gone to Texas, and he owned a piece of the Texas prairie, which just happened to be situated over some huge oil reserves. Roy's brother was set for life. A week before Christmas one year, the oil man visited his younger brother and presented him with a top-of-the-line new car. And that car became Roy's pride and joy. One day, he reached, he went, he went out his front door, and on his way to his car, a poorly dressed little boy was peering through the window at the sleek dashboard. And as Roy got closer, the boy said, is this your car, mister? Sure is, he said. How much did it cost you? I don't rightly know. Roy said. You see, my brother gave it to me as a gift. And the little boy said, I wish. I wish. And Roy thought, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, I wish I had a brother like that. And the little boy looked up at him and with these enormous eyes, he said, I wish, mister, that I could be a brother like that. There's the fellow destined for greatness. He has greatness in his bones. Christ the servant is our model. Greatness comes when we can focus on how we can better the lives of others, on how we can make a positive impact on the world around us. Amen.
let us bow our heads and turn to God in a time of prayer. Holy, gracious, and loving God, we give you thanks for giving us the model of living with humility, of serving those in need, of making an impact on one life at a time. We pray for uh, leaders in our community, in our nation, and around the world that, that each would cultivate that quality in their lives, that we would all cultivate that quality. We give you thanks for this community of faith and the opportunities that you present to go into the world, sow the good news, and grow in faith. And we pray for our many mission partners. We pray in particular this morning for all those places that are still cleaning up after the recent hurricanes, floods, fires, and the earthquake in Haiti. Be with all who are, who are impacted. Be with those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Be with those who begin the process of, of rebuilding. We pray for those in our ongoing prayer concerns, those who have been hospitalized, those who are facing uncertainty, those who struggle with the coronavirus. We especially lift up today Jerry Codney, Laurie Bronk, uh, Benny Bailey, L Lily Berg, the Herb family, Dale Gabor, Marsha, Marvin, Howard, Lauren Hutnick, Carol Koval, Teresa Ludwigson, Dana Lutz, Heidi, Mitch, Lindsay, Barb, Carolyn, Nikki, Laura Pockert, Richie, Robin, Dorothy Smith, Jim Susnick, Audrey Veith, Tom Vosmer. We pray for the family of Russell Wilson, or Ginny Garkey, Pat and Don Mitchell, Carol Skirbin, Brandon, Jim Myers, Judy Fulton, Ruth Hall, Jim Jaykosh, Emily Lockley, Natalie Mandel, Laura Meyer, Bill Pockert, Mark Raines, Tom Reichert, the Zebro family, and all those who we name now before you, aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. All these, Lord, and those things that we pray with size too deep for words, we pray them all in your most precious name. Amen. We remember on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering, we pray as Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to receive communion. We'll uh, offer it in a contact-free way. If you will just come forward on the angled aisles and hold your hands out like this, we will place the communion into your hands.
Thank you for being here today and making worship a part of your week. Again, check out the, uh, the portraits of Christ in the gathering space. Next week, we wrap up this worship series already. I've, I've enjoyed it. Jesus as Lord. Let's stand and join Atrium. When Atri. I remember. When I remember. All right. One of my favorites. Let's stand. When I remember.
Take care.